Hello, it's really good to be with you here today as we continue on with our Live Better series. And, and today we're going to be talking about a really important topic, probably the most important thing in life. And I would say, and I'm wondering what you would think as you're thinking this through yourself, but I'm, I'm saying today that probably being able to have and develop and grow in loving relationships is probably the most important thing in life. Learning to have healthy, loving relationships is so important. It makes all the difference in the world. In terms of the quality of our life, there's a great deal of research that talks about how when we're in loving relationships, when we're connected with other people, when we're not isolated, when we're not alienated, but we're connected and we're caring, that we're so much healthier physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and socially. And so today's topic about how to have loving and caring relationships is so important. And then we're going to spend a lot of time then talking about healthy boundaries and codependency, because I think when we stop and think about healthy relationships and loving and caring, automatically in the real world, something that comes up about relationships is about boundaries. Like who am I and who are you and how do we get together and where do I stop and where do I begin and where do you begin and where do you stop and how do we come together in healthy ways. That's so important in terms of the health of a relationship and when you stop and think about it, that's where a lot of our problems are in relationships, is where we get kind of mixed up about boundaries. We become overly responsible, um, overly controlling, or we become irresponsible. Um, so we're going to be spending our time talking about this, and I hope that as we go through the class, at the end of the class, you'll be able to say, you know what I learned? one or two good things today about boundaries that I hope will help me have a better loving relationship with my friends, my parents, my significant other, my spouse, my partner, people that are in my recovery group, people that are in my church group. So I'm hoping that you'll be able to say you're getting one or two healthy things that you can use. So of course, we always want to start off with, with our ACT paradigm. And so, as we're talking about <coughs> relationships today, we want to start off thinking about the bluebird of happiness. And that is the idea that I can live a vital and meaningful life. So as I say that, I hope right now, you're asking yourself that question. It's like, do I believe that for myself? And even more importantly, am I willing to believe that for myself? that I can live a vital life and I can live a meaningful life. And I hope you're all saying yes. You know that you can. And so today's topic about relationships and boundaries is so important when we talk about living that meaningful uh, and vital life. Now, some other things that are so important for us, especially using our paradigm of acceptance and commitment therapy, so in living this vital and meaningful life, that means we need to be in touch with our thoughts and our feelings, and we need to learn to be in touch with others and be able to tolerate our good and bad and ugly thoughts and feelings and other people's good and bad and ugly feelings. So in terms of tolerating this, then one of the symbols that we have is the idea of the beach ball, huh? Now, there are a lot of things that happen in relationships where we just want to push that beach ball underwater, huh? We say, I don't want to think about it. I don't want to know about it. I don't want to talk about it. I'm going to pretend that it's not there. Let's pretend that it's not there. And so we push that beach ball underwater, hoping that it'll just go away, huh? That we're not going to have to think about it or talk about it. But of course, what happens when we're at the beach or we're at the pool 
and we press down on that beach ball, eventually our arms get really tired, don't they? And eventually that beach ball has to come up. And so by practicing our mindfulness, by just letting our thoughts and feelings come up and letting them sit on the top of the water, and then we start to learn that we can acknowledge them and we can tolerate them and we can identify them, that their good feelings or bad feelings are troubling or joyful or enthusiastic or they might be ugly or whatever kind of feelings we feel that they are, that we can tolerate them, first of all, as an individual person and then with our significant other or our friend or our support group, that we can let these thoughts and feelings come up. We can let them be there. Now, the other thing, of course, once we let them come up, then the Chinese finger trap, huh? The idea of not struggling with them, but just letting them be. Because we know with our thoughts and our feelings, right, that the more we struggle against them, I don't want it to be this way, I don't want my friend or my partner, or my spouse to be this way, I don't want life to be this way, so we struggle against it, we end up trapping ourselves, don't we? We get trapped. So the way to freedom, the way to free ourselves up is by through radical acceptance and say, I accept myself for who I am. I accept my thoughts and feelings for what they are. I accept my dad, my mom, my brother, my sister, my spouse, my partner, people in my support group, my church group, my peer group. I'm willing to accept me and us for who we are. Now, again, that doesn't mean that we completely like certain aspects of ourselves or of other people, but rather than struggle against it and, and really cause suffering for ourselves, because we realize when I, when I struggle against myself or my mom or my dad or my friend or my partner, my brother, my sister, I create suffering for myself. So to free myself up, to free ourselves up from suffering, we say, I'm going to accept this rather than struggle against it, okay? So the other symbol, of course, that we want to take a look at with life in general, but then especially with relationships, is this idea of a new pair of glasses, huh? That when I'm looking at relationships today and boundaries, I'm willing to say, you know what? Maybe I need to get a new perspective on this. Maybe I can learn something new about my perspective of myself or relationships or about life today. So that willingness then to have a new perspective today. So the bluebird of happiness, the beach ball, accepting ourselves and other people as they are, and then what? Then we want to get into action. And the action up here is the one, two, three. And that's to identify what are my values today in general, and then what are my values when it comes to relationships? And then even more especially, what are my values when it comes to having healthy boundaries? And especially with the people that we're closest to. What are my values in terms of healthy boundaries? Like love and kindness, autonomy, respect, empowerment, not enabling. What, what are my values around that? We're going to be exploring those issues together today. So I'd like you to think about one or two or three close relationships that you have in your life right now. Think about one or two or three close relationships that you have and then kind of do a little inventory or do an evaluation. Not to judge the other person, or certainly not to judge ourselves, but just to evaluate the relationship and say, well, how's it going? How's it going with my daughter, with my son, with my mom, with my dad, with my brother and sister, my spouse, my partner, my friend? How's it going with things like caring? How's it going with love, communication? How are we doing with our boundaries? How, how are we doing? And as you ask yourself that question, you might see that you've done some good growing and some things are really better. Some other things might come to your mind where you go, well, that's kind of troubling, or gosh, I think my relationship with so-and-so would be better if we could learn some new lessons about how to relate to one another in healthy ways. And so hopefully in today's class, we'll do that. 
So one of the things we're going to talk about today, as I said, we're going to talk about boundaries. And I have three diagrams for you to kind of think about in terms of boundaries. So this is like a diagram for healthy, a healthy relationship. So we'll say this is one person here. This is another person here. And these people love each other. They care about each other. And so they're sharing part of their lives with each other. And that's what this is right here. So here's one whole person. Here's another whole person. And then this is what they're sharing together, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and socially. They're sharing that part. And so they're keeping intact their own individuality. But then to a degree, they're, they're surrendering their individuality. They're being vulnerable. They're letting another person, they're letting each other into their lives. So that's a healthy diagram. Now, we're going to take a look at two unhealthy diagrams, unhealthy relationships. This one here, here's one person here. Here's another person here. And here's a brick wall right here. So this is healthy. This is called disengaged. And disengaged means there's no engagement. Now, these people might be spouses. It might be uh, a child and a parent. It might be a former, so former spouses. It might be with, with a, a child. It might be with a brother or sister. It might be with a friend. But the boundary is up. It's like, it's like Muhammad Ali doing a rope-a-dope, huh? Where we put up our defenses and we say, nobody's getting beyond this. I can't trust enough. I can't let go enough. I'm not going to let anyone in. And so there's this individual person, and this individual person, and there's a brick wall there. And so we would say, well, if there's going to, and again, sometimes that comes up. Maybe these people used to be close. Maybe they used to be close, but then something happened. And we felt we had to put up a brick wall to defend ourselves. Or maybe it's just our stance in general, maybe because we've been hurt or wounded by people close in our lives. And we've said, I'm going to be like Muhammad Ali. Nobody's ever going to lay a glove on me. Nobody's ever going to get that close to me. Nobody's ever really going to get to know me. So I'm going to have a real strong boundary. And so what happens, though, with that real strong boundary, nobody maybe does get in to, to hurt us, but nobody gets in to love us and care about us and give us a hug either, huh? So the word vulnerability comes from a Sanskrit word that means some, when we're vulnerable, somebody gets so close, they can hug us or they can stab us in the back. That's what vulnerability is, that we really let someone in. And, and by letting someone in so close, they can either give us a hug or they can stab us in the back. So that's vulnerability. And so, of course, we want to be careful with our vulnerability. We just don't throw our, our pearl before swine. How we don't just expose ourselves to anyone. And so here's another diagram that I want to have you take a look at. And that is we all live in the world and there are circles of intimacy. That, so this is us right here. There might be one or two people that get to get into the inner circle that really know every, a lot, so much about us and we share a lot of ourselves with them and they do with us. And then there's this next circle and we kind of share ourselves with them and we kind of share ourselves with other people. Then there's another circle out here and we kind of know them a little bit and they kind of know us a little bit. And then there's other people out here and we might just say, hi, how you doing? Did you go to the baseball game? What about the 49ers? What about the Raiders? What about the weather? So these are, there are different levels of intimacy, and this is really healthy. A healthy life includes all of these circles of intimacy. In other words, we just don't let anybody in to know what our business is. Only just a few people get to know that deepest part of ourselves. Why? because it's so sacred and it's so precious and we just can't be putting it out there. 
It's not appropriate. But on the other hand, we have one or two people here. Then there are other people that are kind of close to us. And these might be other family members, other friends, other co-workers, people in support groups, church groups. Then there are other people out here. So a healthy life has, has a variety of all these different kinds of people in our lives. This is different levels of vulnerability, huh? So different levels of vulnerability, which is healthy, and which means also includes defensiveness. So with some people, sometimes we, we put the gloves down and we let them into our lives. But with other people, we have a boundary. We have our gloves up. It's like, no, you know, you don't get to know that about me. Even if you ask, it's like, no, we, you know. So this is healthy, these different boundaries. So this, this is a healthy sharing between two people. If it was a community or a family, it would look like this. It'd be four people with their own individual, each individual person, and there's an area where every, all four people are sharing, or all four people in the group are sharing a little bit. This is where there's such a strong boundary that people are just isolated and alienated in their own little world. Nobody really touches them, and we don't really touch someone else. On the other hand, in the exact opposite, so by the way, this is called a disengaged relationship pattern. This is called an enmeshed pattern. And you can see there's one person here and the second person here. And then there's so much that's shared there that it's hard to distinguish, like, is there, are there two individual people there or is there just one? Now, of course, there is something wonderful in really close relationships, whether it's with our significant other or a partner or a spouse or with a child or a really good friend where we're doing some deep sharing and there's real intimacy. There is that feeling where two people become like one and that's a beautiful experience in, in human life. However, when it can become pathological though, when both people lose their individuality. So you can see over here where it's healthy, everyone keeps their individuality, but then there's also sharing. Here, there's almost no individuality. There's no assertion. There's no, this is what I want. This is who I am. There's only like us. And so that's unhealthy too. It kind of becomes like the Dead Sea with all the water going in, but nothing going out. And so the Dead Sea became a Dead Sea because there's no life going on there. That's what happens in this kind of a relationship. It, the, the, boundaries, the boundaries around these two people are so strong, it's just two people against the world. So that's where that great mystic Gibran said that love is not two people looking into one another's eyes. Love is two people looking out at the world together. So they might be holding hands, but they're looking out at the world together. They're not just staring into each other's eyes day after day after day. So it's important now that we have that idea in mind when we're talking about boundaries here, because now we're going to start moving into codependency. So when we talk about different kinds of love, let's say there's soft love and there's tough love, okay? So soft love is where we have empathy, we have affection, we're there to help someone, we have their back. We all need that, don't we? I mean, we need love and we need affection and kindness, empathy, compassion. My goodness, how that's called heartwarming, huh? How wonderful is that? And if we don't have that, it's a very cold world, isn't it? However, that's not always the only kind of love we need because sometimes it can be too much of being too soft and too empathic and too kind. So as an example is like this guy that had this cocoon and he knew there would be a butterfly coming out of that cocoon eventually. And so the little uh, pupa inside busted out a little bit of the cocoon and then it was trying to squeeze through the cocoon and he could see it was really struggling and it was really hard. 
and he just had so much empathy for this little uh, butterfly to be trying to work its way through the cocoon that he said, that poor thing, it's really struggling. I'm going to make it easier on it. I'm going to get my finger and I'm going to peel back some of the cocoon to make it easier. And so he peeled it back and it kind of came right out. But you know what? It came right out and it started flopping on the table and it never developed the ability to walk or to fly. Why? Because it needed that struggle to develop the strength to be able to walk, so it just flopped around. So sometimes in our relationships, either when we're caring for someone else or someone else is caring for us, if we rob someone of their struggle, if we rob someone of their pain sometimes, in other words, we enable them and we make it too easy, we rob them of the opportunity to grow and they end up being weaker. So sometimes soft love is exactly empathy, love, compassion, affection. We all need that. But sometimes we need to withdraw our love and say, you know what? My, my toddler, my one-year-old needs to learn to stand up and walk on his or her own feet. Because if I'm always carrying them around, if I'm always helping them out, they're never going to learn to stand on their own two feet, are they? So, so affection, kindness, compassion, the milk of human life is what it's called. Very important. But sometimes we need to withdraw that. And we need to have a little more tough love. So with tough love, what does that look like? That's love too. So it's like yin and yang, huh? Real love consists of both lo affection, kindness, empathy. Also, though, things accountability, responsibility, not enabling someone, empowering someone. I know you can do it. You alone can do it, but you don't have to do it alone. So with tough love, this is where we kind of stand back. And we say, you know, you need to learn to walk on your own two feet. You need to work your way through that cocoon so you can walk and then you can fly. So I'm going to withdraw right now which is not very easy to do sometimes, is it? So sometimes the loving thing is to step in and help someone, and sometimes the loving thing is to step back and not help someone. That ta it takes wisdom then to know when to do that, right? When do we step in and help, and when do we withdraw? Because both of those are loving. And so as I'm saying that right now, Probably some of you feel some anxiety, huh? And so when we're talking about codependency, one of the main things we're talking about is anxiety. Because so often when someone that we love is having a hard time and they're struggling, we're so anxious, even though what we should do is withdraw and step back, it's like, you know, like our little 11 or 12 or 13 month old child that's starting to stand up on the furniture and they're going to take their first step and we know they're going to fall and we're afraid they're going to fall and we know they're going to fall or when we've got a four or five or six year old and we're holding the back of the bicycle seat, we're running along with them and then we know that we have to let go. We have to let go of that bicycle seat and we know they're going to fall. So in codependency, we're needing to deal with our anxiety about letting go. Can we let go? There are so many parents in their 40s and 50s and 60s who will come to me with their adult children and say, oh my gosh, you know, and maybe they've got a mental illness, their child has a mental illness or an alcohol or a drug problem. And they say, we're beside ourselves. We keep bailing them out. We keep helping them out. Money, apartments, cars, insurance, medications, treatment centers, like we can't let go. We, and so I'll talk with them about they have to be able to deal with their anxiety and tolerate their anxiety. Or spouses who come in. Or adult children who are caring for their parents. And they'll say, my goodness, you know, we keep bailing mom out or we keep bailing dad out. 
we've got to stop doing this, but it's so difficult for me because I'm so anxious. I can't, I can't let go. I can't let go. So I keep, so I have a 19 year old and I'm riding, I'm walking alongside them on the bicycle now, huh? <laughs> or a 60 year old and I'm holding onto the bicycle, huh? When am I going to let go? I'm exhausting myself. Plus, I don't get to have a life, do I? Because my life is totally revolving around this other person. So eventually we say, I'm tired and I need a life. So wisdom to know when do, I, when do we step in and when do we let go? Which means we need to learn to deal with our anxiety. Which also means when can we trust? When can we trust? Trust the universe, trust the higher power, and trust that person and empower them and say, you know, I know you can do it. You can do it. If we keep telling someone that we love, I know you can't do it. I know you can't do it. That's why you need me. Or that's why you need so and so. I know you can't do it. Well, that's really disempowering, isn't it? So although we're wanting to help, we're really detracting. That's called, that would be a disempowering communication. So we want to say, you know, you alone can do it, but you don't have to do it alone. You can do it with others, but you're the one that has to take those steps. So, so this idea then about dealing with our anxiety is so important. Now, one of the things that we'd want to do on the second page of your handout is we want to be clear that when we're being codependent, I talked about anxiety, but the good news is the anxiety is based on love. The fact that we love this person, we don't want them to be hurting, we want them to be healthy. And, and we want to make ourselves available. We are willing to extend ourselves with compassion and empathy to help someone. That's the good news. Now the other part of the news is though, we need to know when do I step back? When do I let go? When do I give them the empowering message? I know you can do it. In other words, we give up being overly responsible and overly controlling. Because when we're being codependent, we, we're, we're messed up with our boundaries. We're in an enmeshed relationship and we're taking on way too much responsibility for someone else's health, someone else's happiness someone else's security. We need to move from this enmeshed relationship and do some letting go and move over here where you are you and I am me and we'll meet in the middle, but we need to be separate people here. We say to our child or to our adult child or to our parent or to our spouse. So how do we know though? How do we know that maybe this is happening with us? Well, we've got some symptoms right here in our handout. Let's take a look at this. So, the first one that's mentioned here is, do I worry excessively about someone? Is somebody always on my mind? First thing in the morning, Last thing at night, throughout the day, how so-and-so, I hope they're okay. Maybe I should text them, maybe I should call them. Maybe I should, you know, what can... So it's not that we're concerned about somebody, but we're excessively worried about them. Oh, I just saw this on Oprah, you need to watch this. Let me buy you this book. I just heard about this new kind of support group. So we're always worried about them and what can I do? Now again, this has to do with balance, huh? It's not a matter of black and white. We do want to be concerned about other people. We do want to help other people. But if we're, all, if we're excessively worrying about them, that's a red flag that there might be a boundary issue here. The next one that we want to take a look at is, how much time do we spend trying to control the behavior of someone else? I'll give you this if you stop. I'll give you this if you do that. If you don't do that, I'm going to take this. So how much time and energy are we spending trying to control someone? And again, I'm not talking about influencing someone. I'm talking about controlling someone. 
And again, like a lot of times parents will run into this because you know as parents, we have a lot of responsibility for four-year-olds and eight-year-olds and nine-year-olds, but then you start getting up into 12 and 16 and 17, then we're talking about when do I start letting go? When do I let go and say, well, they're an adult or they're almost an adult and they need to start suffering the consequences of their decisions because if they don't suffer the consequences of their decisions, they're going to keep doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. They're going to think I'm always there to bail them out and life isn't like that. So I have to let go, even though it scares me, I have to let go of my spouse or my friend or my dad or my mom or my kid because maybe they need to fall down on the bike to realize what they're doing wrong. So that's where we know that pain is the touchstone of growth. Pain is a real friend in our lives. However, do we love someone that we love enough? Do we love them enough to let them experience pain and experience the natural consequence of their behavior so they can learn their lesson and they can grow. Because if we keep robbing them of their pain, they're not going to grow. What are some other red flags? Taking responsibility for somebody else's behavior, being overly guilty, blaming ourselves for someone else's behavior. Right next to that, feeling guilty like, I should do more, I should do more, I should do more. Now again, if that thought comes to our mind, maybe sometimes as a spouse or a friend or a parent, we need to listen to that. We need to be mindful of that. We need to let that beach ball come up and listen to that. And we need to evaluate that and say, well, is that true? Do I need to do more? Do I need to get out of my self-centeredness and do I need to do more as a parent or as a friend? Or am I having overly excessive codependent guilt? And that's just neurotic guilt. And I need to let that go. I need to stop listening to that. That's not helpful for me or for them. The next one is taking over someone else's responsibilities. Not allowing them to be responsible for their lives. The one next to that, covering up what's going on. Covering up with their employer, covering up with their spouse, covering up with the kids, pretending like things really aren't that way. It's really not that way, kids. Not taking care of our own needs. Now again, frequently in our classes we talk about we don't want to be self-centered and it's all about me. However, basic human life requires that we have self-love and we need to attend to our own physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, and social needs. In codependency, quite frequently, we, we negate our own needs. We don't take care of our own physical needs our own social needs, our mental, our material needs, and our life is totally centered on this, on this other person. And then eventually, that's why frequently codepend people suffering from codependency end up sicker than the other person because we've exhausted our physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual resources. And then we end up sicker than the other person that supposedly we were taking care of. Are we frequently overwhelmed? Are, do we frequently feel inadequate? Do we frequently feel fatigued? It takes a lot of energy to be carrying an adult person around with us. How huh? this 175 pound person all 24 hours a day, it gets heavy, doesn't it? It starts to become very fatiguing. Or do we find ourselves always making excuses for this person? Oh yeah, but you have to understand this about when they were a child or when they were a teenager. Or you need to understand this about their first marriage or you need to understand this about... And of course we do need to understand things, but are we always making excuses for them as to why they can't and then fill in the blanks, huh? We talked earlier about frequent anxiety. That's an important barometer for us if we're being codependent. Frequent sadness, 
about what we see in the life of our loved one and not being able to deal with that sadness? Are we always rescuing them from one crisis to the next? And then lastly, are we really angry? And it's not unusual because with codependent people, you know, when we're being codependent, we are nice, we are loving, we have a hard time. So a lot of times when we're being codependent, you see a lot of passive, passive aggressive behavior. Or sometimes because we're pushing that beach ball underwater and then we can't hold it underwater, then the anger comes out in rage and the stuff hits the fan. So these are symptoms of codependency. And if you're recognizing several of these and they're pretty intense, you might want to say, whoa, 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 wait a minute here. What's going on with me? What's going on with me in terms of my caring, loving relationships? What's going on with me in terms of boundaries? Do I need to be a little more loving in terms of soft love or a little more loving in terms of tough love? Do I need to stop enabling? Do I need to do some letting go? Do I need to start focusing on myself? So you might ask yourself that question if you saw a number of those symptoms. Now, let's go ahead and get into the solution. And down here at the bottom, these are nine things that we can do to take care of ourselves to get back our own health and get back to being grounded and centered and balanced and loving ourselves as well as other people. So the first one is, we want to continue to be responsible, which means the ability to respond. We want to be able to be, respond to the needs of others. But the caveat is, but let go of needing to be in control. Let go of needing to be in control. That's a healthy boundary, huh? I want to be able to respond to you, but I don't need to control you. You're an adult. I've shared with you some rationale or some good reasons why you might want to consider doing this, but you're an adult person. If that's what you want to do, I'm letting go. I acknowledge your ability to make decisions. You're in control of your life, I'm not. Number two, it's okay for us to ask for help. We're so used to, so many people that I've counseled over the years who have become who have developed patterns of codependency, they have the hardest time asking for help. They're really good at giving help to others. They have the hardest time asking for help. So number two is know that it's okay to ask for help, to go to an Al-Anon meeting, a CODA meeting, to be involved in therapy, to go to a church group, to get a mentor, a sponsor, to say, you know what? I can't figure this out by myself, or I'm all discombobulated, or I've lost track of the direction of my life. I need someone or some people to support me. It's okay to ask for help. Number three, set boundaries with other people. This especially means learning to say no. Sometimes yes is the loving answer, and sometimes no is the loving answer. <coughs> learning to say yes and learning to say no. Number four, have the courage to let go and let the other person experience the consequences. Number five, be at peace with our limitations. Frequently, when we're caught in patterns of codependency, we exhaust ourselves because we're running around like chickens with our heads cut off, trying to save this person that we care and, and we love but we exhaust ourselves because we're playing God. And we need to say, you know what? I can't do it all. You need to go to see a doctor. You need to go see a psychiatrist. You need a therapist. You need group therapy. You need a support group. You need a church. You need other people in your life. I can't do it all for you. I can't do it all for you. So be, being able to say that and, it, and, and to be at peace with that and know that it's okay. I'm sorry, I can't do this all for you. You need to find some other resources in your life. Number six, develop your own plan of self-care. 
What do you need physically in terms of sleep and exercise and nutrition? What do you need mentally? What do you need emotionally? What do you need spiritually? And then take responsibility for getting your own needs met. Because it's like what they say on the airplane, you know, if the airplane starts to go down and the oxygen masks drop, they'll tell you if you have a child on your lap or sitting next to you, before you put the oxygen on them, put it on yourself because if you're not breathing oxygen, if you're no good to yourself, you're no good to anybody else. So that's one of the key things with, with codependent self-recovery. What is our self-care plan? Number seven, forgive ourselves for the mistakes that we've made. And we all make mistakes. And especially if we're trying to love someone who's physically or mentally or emotionally ill, or they have an addictive disorder, and we've gotten mixed up with boundaries and we've tried hard to help them. Yes, we've made mistakes. Of course we did. So it's okay to make mistakes. And so we want to forgive ourselves and say, you know what, my intentions were good, but I have to admit I made a mistake here. I made a mistake here. I made a mistake here. Now I forgive myself because I was trying to do my best. I forgive myself. Number eight, forgive other people. Forgive that person with the mental illness, with the addictive disorder. Forgive the doctors for not knowing everything and maybe not being able to help your loved one. Or forgive that therapist or forgive the people in the emergency room because they're limited too. They don't know everything. Maybe they were trying to do their best. Or maybe they were having a bad day. And then number eight, Accept, accept that we can change ourselves, but that we can't change anybody else. Huh? We have control over our own decisions. We have control over our own behaviors, but we have no control over another adult person's decisions, their choices, and their behavior. So to let go of that and be at peace with that. That's an emotional boundary, huh? to be at peace with that and say, that's okay. They have to find their own way. Huh? Can you see yourself saying that to yourself? I'm letting go, they have to find their own way. The other thing that's true for us is to say, you know what, I needed to find my own way and I don't like other people telling me what to do. Huh? I don't like other people telling me what to do and I needed to find my own way so I'm gonna let go and I'm not going to try to tell them what to do. And I'm going to trust them and I'm going to trust the universe and let them find their own way. So as we're finishing up here today, we've gone through the signs and symptoms of when we might be in trouble. We've talked about the healthy things we can do. And in being aware of those signs and symptoms and being aware of those healthy things, of course, the goal is, the goal is, that we can have healthy boundaries and we can have healthy, loving relationships. And because we love ourselves and we're growing and we're developing and we're more capable of loving other people, the quality of our life is so much better. And more days we say, you know what, it's good to be alive. And I feel connected with other people. Some people I feel very close to some people I feel kind of close to. Some people, I just wish them well. I want them to have a good day. I care about them too. But then we've got healthy boundaries and we're connected to our own inner selves and we're connected with others in a healthy way and living a good life. Like we started off saying, yes, it's okay for me to live a vital and meaningful life. It's like, so we're ending this up saying, yes, it's okay for me to live a vital and meaningful life. And I want to continue to learn and grow. How can I have healthier boundaries so that I can live a meaningful life and a vital life? As always, you guys, it's been a real honor to spend this time with you. Thank you very much. Take good care of yourselves. Okay, you guys? <laughs>